fellow students and friends who are here studying globalization. So these next two lectures that I'm about to do are going to be over ancient globalization. Now often when we think of globalization, we will return to our definition, our authoritative definition here from Professor Steiger, um, or Steiger, and um, we will think if we just reminisce on what our mind might tell us globalization was all about, um, that it's about the modern world specifically, and really just the last, say, 50 years or so. Uh, but I think if we really delve deeply into the past, we will see that the world has long been interconnected through series of social processes that intensified world social interdependencies and exchanges. And that many cultures, both local and distant, were aware of each other uh, and, and fed and grew and exchanged things uh, from each other um, long, long ago. So without further ado, let us begin our examination of the past. And we will really be going from the time of, of uh, primitive man to uh, really up until almost the Protestant Reformation. And we will do this all in under an hour. Now, for a lesser historian, um, this would be impossible. But uh, for me, we will see if I can get this accomplished. I'm, I'm confident in my abilities. So let us begin just by looking really quickly. Um, the earliest age of, of humankind, and I apologize if I lapse into saying man. Uh, I, I do not uh, mean to interject the masculine, but uh, it just simply lapse into this from time to time. Um, but for as long as human beings have lived, we have tried, we have studied human beings since they really began to to develop from from earlier forms of uh, of uh, primates, as as scientific uh, Darwinian explanations would suggest. And I am going to privilege that explanation over a, a more theological one uh, for the, this lecture. Um, but we, ha how do we begin to understand humankind? Well, it's through the use of tools when we say well when what uh, when we date something through archaeology because there's no written records for this long ago um, we say paleolithic mesolithic neolithic and all this is based upon the kinds of tools that humankind was using and as you can see here you go when you go from paleolithic which means old stone to mesolithic which means middle stone to neolithic meaning new stone to bronze, to iron, uh, it's based upon the kinds of tools that we we uh, used, or our ancestors used. Um, and within this is the development of new technology. And I think when we, we think of globalization, we often think of developing new technologies that made us interconnected, that are shared and adapted by other civilizations. And as humankind developed, we see the invention of these tools in one place, and we see a quick and rapid spread um, to other parts of the world and other uh, cultures and, and other groups of people. I won't say civilizations or even societies within the Stone Age, but certainly within the Bronze and Iron Age. We see civilizations developing in, in uh, river valleys, and that um, the, use, uh, the, the, the exchange between technology and tools makes uh, initially one civilization will come... Uh, to preeminence over another because of its development of technology. And as the technology is adapted and changed uh, and, and, uh, and taken by other cultures, then uh, the, 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 uh, the other cultures catch up quickly, as we see in our modern globalization. So another aspect of, of globalization in, in, uh, in modern terms is that you see an interconnected world of people who migrate um, easily going across borders, and in many cases, I think, if, as you look at earlier humans, um, it's much easier to actually cross borders because they were not as, as hard, and we don't have nation-states in the same way that we do kind of after the, the Reformation period of, of around 1500, but we see numerous migrations, um, one of them uh, being the Indo-European migration, where the uh, a group of people, of nomadic peoples, travel across the Asian steppes, really from the, the Ponto-Caspian steppes, 
and then they migrate all over into all as far as India and into the British Isles. And these are the Indo-European peoples, and basically all European languages, I think, except for Basque, uh, uh, Finnish, and uh, there may be one more is, is actually part of this this uh, this Indo-European language family. So you see migrations, you see the sharing of, of languages that then uh, then they 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 branch out. Uh, to create everything from Latin to Greek to Hindi, uh, Farsi, so we see all of these these uh, these linguistic groups that have been created from these earliest migrations and the sharing of of uh, this early Indo-European culture as they moved all over uh, Europe and Asia. So as you can see here, not only did this happen in uh, in Central. Uh, or, or in Eastern Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, but we see migrations that occurred all over the world. That uh, human beings really started in Eastern Africa, and from there they developed technologies and moved their cultures all across the world as far as North America, Central America, South America. Um, that. Uh, uh, Australia, that human beings were quite adept, um, and they, they used technology, and they were able to, to use technology that other cultures had adapted to be able to migrate all over the world. So what were some of these really key technologies that led to the development of human civilization and an increased interconnectivity from the time of hunter-gatherer societies? Well, I like to call this the equine revolution. Um, because this is when we, uh, when I say we, human beings, began to, to harness the power of, of animals. Uh, that the, the horse was domesticated, um, that, the, that the oxen were domesticated, and they were able to be put to use in a way to cultivate crops. And as time went on, as we see in the modern world with, say, the development of the computer, that we saw in the ancient world, the development of something like the wheel, uh, from the earliest time of a cod, where it's a, 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 a completely um, connected stone wheel, to the time of the, the Hittites, uh, nearly uh, 2,000 years after that, that we see uh, the development of the spoken wheel, to where you can have a very light uh, chariot that you can can move very quickly that can be used for warfare or or uh, speed and travel uh, but uh, we see here the development of new technologies that interconnected societies and one of the biggest changes in how human beings lived was the this agricultural revolution um, now humans in 10,000 BC had not yet domesticated the horse they had not they were not using animals but they began to cultivate cereals. And when you are able to generate enough of a caloric surplus by cultivating grasses and such crops, um, like wheat and barley, um, then you are able to continue to live in one place permanently. And this allows you to be able to, to have, uh, or at least to stay in one area permanently. And eventually, when you perfect this, this technology, this agricultural uh, ability to farm then and domesticate animals, um, it allows for the development eventually of urban centers. Now, they don't develop as early as 10,000, um, but as these technologies, as I say, are perfected, um, it creates civilization. So how do civilizations develop? Well, you've got to have, as I say, an agricultural surplus. You need uh, governments to be able to manage large groups of people together. Now, when in the ancient world, 30,000 people, that's a whopper of a city. Um, but nevertheless, 30,000 people living together requires things like running water, sewage. Um, you have to have uh, invention, that you have to have people who have the leisure time to invent things, uh, to, to uh, perfect the, the administration of government, of cities, of building, of mathematics. And all this comes from uh, interconnectivity of social processes that build on one another and the, and human beings that work together uh, and exchange ideas and things. If, and I think this is globalization. And when you see these, these uh, civilizations develop, you begin to see commerce. 
that when you have enough of a surplus, and usually this is always agricultural surplus or or manufacture, something of this nature, you're going to you can you can exchange it with other civilizations that does something better or produces something that you don't have. So this is early commerce, and we do see early trade uh, within Sumer as, as uh, early as uh, in the, the 4th century uh, B.C. So uh, we, we are seeing commerce, interconnectivity of human societies very early on. And one key thing, probably the key thing for us understanding what is going on is... When we began to see writing, now the earliest forms of human writing is cuneiform, and it, it originates in Sumer in present-day Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates River, Mesopotamia, um, around the year 3000. And other societies began developing uh, writing, uh, uh, forms of writing um, as early, uh, uh, sh uh, shortly after that. Um, uh, Egypt begins a pictographic kind of style of writing called we call hieroglyphics, um, and uh, then you see Sanskrit develop around a thousand years after cuneiform uh, within uh, India. But all of this allows for human beings to record things. It allows them to be able to pass on their knowledge uh, in a concrete way. It allows them to be able to record taxes, and sure enough, our earliest writings that we have while well, they're tax receipts, uh, which suggests, again, that there is a, a high interest in commerce, in trade, and in interconnectivity of, of the exchange of goods and ideas, uh, and this has been passed to us through posterity, and it was passed down through their, these, uh, these civilizations so they can build upon their knowledge. Um, when we think of early civilizations, we often don't think, perhaps, of empire. But some of the, this, these forms of government that brought massive areas of the ancient world under the control of one or a few groups of people did happen as early as the 3rd century BC. Uh, we see the Akkadian Empire, uh, which uh, centered on the uh, the, the city of Akkad ran by Sargon the Great. Um, it was the first empire that ever stretched across the entirety of Mesopotamia. When I say Mesopotamia, I mean this region here, this land between the two rivers. So, when I say empire, what exactly does that mean? Well, empire, generally speaking, means a big area that controls a group of, or a multilinguistic groups of people, that it's larger than just one region, and there is some kind of a central administration, whether it be one human being, or a, a group of human beings, or a, a, a senate, or something like that, that controls this, um, and, and this, this organization, this political, economic uh, organization has to have sort of uh, the ability to keep peace and security within this this, this territorial region that is controlled. And within this, we have to see local customs, and we have to have a ruling class that is able to manage multiple cultures. So I think when you see the Akkadian Empire, you see all of these things, and you see within this many of, of the traits that we cite when we say globalization, and we see, see this as early as, I think, as a, the time of Akkad. And we don't need to concern ourselves with all the, the governance of, of an Akkadian empire, um, but know that there was a centralized management of a very large region over many cultures that brought in taxation, uh, that, uh, that managed trade, that managed agricultural production, um, and that it standardized a system of economics exchange. This sounds a lot like globalization to me. Uh, we can go a little bit farther, and we can in in time, and we can see uh, in the old or uh, the uh, uh, the Paleo Babylonian Empire. Here, um, we see one of its most famous rulers, Hammurabi, and what was Hammurabi most famous for? Well, Hammurabi created a law code. He did many things, but he's most famous for this this law code that he created. 
Um, and it's a very sophisticated group of laws that uh, attempts to manage a very sophisticated society. Um, and uh, they, they do as many things in this law code as probably our own laws do. Now, there's some things that are different. Uh, I, I describe this as within the, the 282 laws that Hammurabi has put on this great stone uh, cylinder that there are laws of retaliation and laws of arbitration. Now, the laws of retaliation are something like if, if someone comes over and sets your house on fire, if they commit arson on your house, um, that you then will be thrown into the fire, or you, will, you yourself will be thrown onto a fire if you're convicted of arson. Um, now, the, but the, the laws are more uh, sophisticated than this. Say a husband abandons his wife and children. Uh, they go, the state uh, goes and f gets the husband and forces him to pay alimony effectively um, to his family, that he must take care of his family. So it's a fairly sophisticated law system um, that is managing a very complex and sophisticated society. So we can't always think, when we think of the ancient world, as being uh, simple and mundane, but they had uh, highly, highly complex systems of law. Now let us turn and look at China very quickly. Um, China, Chinese culture goes all the way back, uh, you know, to 6,000 BC or, or even there a little before. Um, and its geographic isolation creates a, a, a truly a cultural constant. And much like in, in Mesopotamia, the, uh, the Chinese develop in, in river valleys. All famous, or all, uh, all early civilizations develop in river valleys. Um, but the Chinese, like their Mesopotamian brethren, were able to, uh, to domesticate enough crops to where they were able to create and generate a very large civilization. Um, and it became so great of a civilization because of its geographical isolation. Other, outside of, of one region, it is, China is totally protected by uh, geographical regions, whether that be mountains, the ocean, or, for, or dense, dense forests, uh, except in the north where they built a wall. So why would you build a wall? Um, well, you could say it was built for defense, but unmanned and unprotected walls are not very good for defense. But actually some scholars have suggested that the Great Wall of China, which is in reality a massive series of construction projects that took place over the course of more than a thousand years, almost two thousand years actually, um, and it was built somewhat for defense against the Mongolian nomads. Um, but when you really begin to look at these nomadic peoples, you begin to understand that they are trading partners. And this might actually be uh, more of a trade barrier or a cultural barrier um, than it was for defense. So this way you had to pay your taxes uh, instead of just sneaking around and going through the woods. Um, but it, it became much easier to bring trade through the gate and to deal with these, uh, quote, barbarian uh, Mongolians uh, over rather than, uh, uh, you know, hiking through the mountains. And this was the wall, rather than being primarily defensive, was actually more of a trade barrier. And then also it demarcated what was civilized China from what was barbarian Mongolia. Um, that it was quite clearly that this is a, a line that they are drawing to say this is civilization on one side, this is not on the other, but we will still work and trade with these people. Uh, which sounds a lot like modern globalization and anti-globalization, uh, right? That we see we're trying to protect our own cultures from other cultures that we feel are alien and threatening. Um, and this is sort of anti-globalization you see in the ancient world. So again, here you can see all the civilizations of the ancient world, and we're going to look at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, uh, which is in ancient India, in the Indus Valley. Um, and here, much like in China, much like in Mesopotamia, we see systematic city planning, we see standardization, we see the creation of highly sophisticated mud-brick cities, um, we see international trade. We see items that have come as far as Mesopotamia um, very early on in the second century BC. So there is international trade going on here. Um, could this be globalization? Well, it certainly might be. Let us turn our attention now away from, from uh, what we might call civilizations to 
tribal groups of people that lived upon the Asian steppes. Now, the Asian steppes are a 6,000-mile highway system of grasslands that go uh, from the, uh, the, the uh, South China Sea all the way um, to the Hungarian plain, to the, really to the Black Forest in, in Germany. And within these regions uh, is where the Silk Road developed. Now, there, there were people that lived in these regions, very hardy nomads, people that traveled uh, all the way, I say, from Mongolia to the Hungarian plains and back and forth. And it was a, a migratory route uh, as uh, they moved with their animals and the, through the seasons, and they were legendary horsemen uh, and horse archers that were, were terribly feared. Um, but they, they uh, played a part in, in the role of trade. And international trade on the Silk Road uh, begins very early on uh, within the ancient world. And we see the luxury goods and items from China uh, moving between China and India. And then we see them moving even farther east into, into Persia and Babylon. Uh, we see the, then even all the way to Europe eventually. Um, but uh, this all comes from China and this comes from from interconnected trade routes and uh, that people who were aware that the Chinese had uh, very incredible luxury items such as silk, uh, such as, as uh, spices. And now everybody might think, why on earth would you uh, travel 4,000 miles in a camel caravan and pay the kind of money that you would have to pay in order to get this get these kind of items why would you pay this much for pepper and spices and and tea well try eating a meal with no spice on it whatsoever <laughs> and you will understand why the wealthy um, were willing to pay for these kinds of luxury goods try wearing a wool shirt all day you will understand why if you had the money you would buy a silk shirt um, so uh, trade came from China, and it was primarily luxury goods. Now, when I say trade, this is not massive, massive international trade. This is a very select and small group of items that are coming to a very small and select group of rich people. Um, but nevertheless, globalization to some degree was happening in the ancient world, and I think this really could... If you really want to say, when did globalization begin, I, I'm not sure you can... Uh, depending on how you would define the term, I mean, it would be hard to say that the Silk Road was not part of a globalized trading network where there was a massive exchange of ideas in, uh, among cultures and languages uh, all across the ancient world from as far as Europe uh, into China. And this trade was able to generate unbelievable wealth for these cities uh, along the trade routes. Now, coming out of the Jade Gate in China, the trade route follows the Oxus River and, and the uh, Juxartish River, uh, and in these cities like Samarkand and Bukhara become just legendary for their wealth, uh, for their, their baths, for their, uh, the, the kind of places that they were able to build from the wealth where merchants would stay at and, and the entertainment services that were there and uh, the warehouses full of goods. Um, but this, this region was among the richest regions in the world. So where on earth is Transoxiana? Well, it's modern day Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan. So when you would think the richest region in the one of the richest regions in the world because of the trade to one of the poorest regions in the world after the in the, the conclusion of, of, uh, of the Silk Road so uh, do not always think that just because a civilization comes to primacy and is able to be highly successful that uh, things will change in the world and it will radically transform how cultures uh, how they they are able to uh, prosper and and they may not always be as prosperous as they once were so this all comes from uh migration or migrations were a, an immense part of the ancient world as well and uh, there's much debate whether these are migrations or invasions of of these uh, nomadic peoples that lived on the steppes of europe um, but they put pressure on the 
quote, civilized parts of the world everywhere. And, and uh, these, these, uh, these Mongolian uh, nomadic peoples, Turkomans, uh, or, or uh, as a linguistic group as they were classed, uh, modern-day Turkey, Turkomen, um, they were very feared, and they eventually came to settle and to control much of the ancient world. Um, but Alexander the Great, we want I want to talk about Alexander just really quickly before we get into kind of the Turkmen and migrations invasions. Um, Alexander the Great was able to conquer all of Persia, all of the ancient world, um, from the tiny kingdom of Macedonia in Greece due to his uh, technological and military, uh, incredible military innovations. Um, and he was, uh, I mean, Alexander himself was probably the greatest general that ever was. Um, but he, w he through his use of technology and his, his use of, of excellent generalship and tactics, um, was able to effectively conquer all of the known world at the time. And when Alexander in the, uh, in the 300s, eventually conquered all of Persia, and he brought this entire region here you see in light yellow under his control, under the control of one human being for a very short time. But what did this do? It allowed for Greek colonization and the transformation of linguistic groups all throughout the ancient world um, that uh, for a time, for quite a long time, um, the language of this area, the spoken language of this, this whole area, was Greek. And these are many cultures, many linguistic groups, but on account of this conquest of Alexander, it transformed linguistic groups uh, to that of being Greek, to the point where the Greek Orthodox Church today still uses Greek as its, as its, uh, its, uh, as its sacred language. Uh, and many of the church fathers uh, wrote in Greek in the East, and, and this separated the church in the, in the East and West from the Latin-speaking West to the uh, Greek-speaking East, uh, which, was, which was very relevant as the church broke into schism effectively over a linguistic uh, uh, debate about uh, the Holy Spirit proceeding from uh, God the Father and God the Son. We won't get into that, but nevertheless, take my word for it. Um, but just to say that this is part of this globalization experience, uh, experience with the transformation of languages. Now, when Alexander dies, his kingdoms fracture apart, um, and they don't remain one, one core group. But what is important is the language and the Greek culture that was given and the exchange of culture between Greece uh, and, and the Persian world, that there, there is a, a massive exchange of ideas, of, of, uh, of living standards, of, of, of ethos. Um, here we see this very early on in the ancient world, far from being a separated, insular-looking um, region. Rather, it was quite cosmopolitan, and it was, was very very globalized, shall we say. Now, let us turn to Rome. When we say the ancient world, often we refer to uh, everything before the rise of ancient Greece and Rome. And Greece and Rome is often referred to as classical. And once Rome in the West falls in 476 AD, then you move into the medieval period. But the earliest Romans scratched their living out of the rocks on the, in the hills uh, just a, above the Tiber River. And it uh, was nothing very fancy, and then the Romans were able to, because of their, their ideas and their thoughts, they were able to, and their hard work, able to expand their control over an empire that spanned the entire Mediterranean region as far as the Caspian Sea into Mesopotamia uh, and nor all across all of North Africa and as far as Scotland in the north. Quite incredible. So the Romans were able to bring ideas. 
They brought new ideas and new thinking that would forever transform the world. Along with Greece, uh, they brought the idea of democracy. Uh, demos meaning the head, the head count, um, uh, caput in, in Latin. Uh, but they were able to bring this new style of government that uh, had really never been seen before, whether it be the Akkadian Empire or the Babylonian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, all were uh, these, these series of, of imperial monarchies. Uh, but uh, the Romans and the Greeks really brought instead this notion of democracy. And one of the, the uh, most important things about democratic systems and democratic exchanges of, of ideas is that you must own a certain amount of land in order to be able to vote. You need to have a vested interest in the state, and you have to serve in the military for free. So if you were a landowner in Rome, you were expected to serve in the, in the military to protect um, the, the res publica, the republic, the public thing. And through this brought a, a, an enormous dedication. And one of the, the great models of this was Cincinnatus. And Cincinnatus was an old, uh, an old man... And he had formerly been uh, a consul of Rome, which is the highest magistrate you can be in Rome. It'd be equivalent to being president of the United States. And Cincinnatus fell on some hard times, and he had nothing but his farm. So he himself is out plowing his field, and Rome comes into a, a period of crisis. And the Senate calls upon him to come and serve as dictator, that they have named him dictator for a short time in order to come and save Rome. And there's this really touching story about Cincinnatus' wife, and she says, Oh, I kept your old uniform and, and your, old, uh, your old toga. I'd kept it locked away in this trunk just in case one more time you might need it. And she dusts off his uniform and hands it to him, and he dons his toga. And uh, the, the senators that came to him, they hail him imperator. And uh, then he marches off, takes command of the army, wins in just a very short amount of time. And uh, he takes off his toga, returns power to the Republic, and goes back to his farm. So he leaves the plow, and he returns to the plow. And as dictator, he could have pardoned all his debts. He could have done anything that he wanted, but his dedication was to the Republic. And this is the, the great democratic ideal that Rome gave, um, and that it was uh, that the, the, uh, the citizen was, was absolutely dedicated to the Republic, and the Republic was greater than any citizen. Um, and I wish I had time to talk about Horatius, but I don't. Um, but Rome created an empire because of great republican virtue. Rome acquired a massive empire very quickly um, because it uh, had this unyielding dedication to this idea of the republic and that citizenship was part of something that was privilege-sharing, that... Um, not only could you be a part of the Roman Republic in a sense that you have to pay tribute to them, but you could have a vested interest in it and that you could vote and people would, uh, would come and protect you. And this was very important in Rome, that, uh, at least in early Republican Rome, that uh, they had um, these virtues and this desire of privilege sharing, that you just weren't a conquered people, but now you get to be part of the system. And when does this all fall apart? Well, it all falls apart um, when individuals, and I think we can really hearken to our own times here in the United States and across the Western world, um, that when individuals begin to put their own interests ahead of that of the state, um, that the state begins to falter. And one of the first individuals was, uh, was actually Marius, uh, but uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla is the first person to ever march on Rome with his, tr with, with his own troops. And he's basically slighted by his old friend Marius um, and uh, on a command that he was supposed to get in the Far East. And Sulla is so angered by this, he, is, he decides that he's in, he is going to, instead of taking his army to go and fight Mithridates uh, in the Far East, um, rather he's going to take his army and he is going to march on Rome. And when he was asked 
why he was doing what he was doing. There were senators that came out and said, Sola, what are you doing? You can't march on Rome. He says, I am marching to Rome to free her from tyrants. And so Sola goes right into Rome. He sets himself up as dictator, um, and he uh, he purges uh, numerous people. Uh, there's there's mass executions, um, and then he, he lays down power. He sets up a few laws, and he lays down his power. And then he goes and drinks himself to death a few years later. None of his reforms survive Sola. Um, and then we enter this period we call the Roman Revolution. And uh, a, group, uh, a group of three men, uh, Marcus Crassus, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, and Gaius Julius Caesar. You may have never heard of the latter, uh, but surely you've heard of the former. Ha ha, that's a historian's joke. Um, these three guys set themselves up in a, something they called the Triumvirate. And they are basically a, a group of individuals that is going to make all the decisions for the state based upon their own personal interests. Uh, eventually, Caesar is able to win out, and Caesar sets himself up initially as dictator for uh, 10 years. Then he beats, becomes dictator for life. Um, he never officially becomes king, and uh, Caesar, he does make some reforms. Um, he does some very good things, but eventually Caesar is uh, stabbed to death by a group of his own conspirators, or a group of people who, uh, who he had pardoned by this, this uh, group of uh, Cassius uh, and Brutus, especially. And um, they murder Caesar on the Senate floor and end uh, his reign. And uh, again, the point here is to show that the man becomes more important than the state. And the old age of the Republicans like Cincinnatus and Horatius Cocles um, have gone away, that it is now a time where the individual is supreme. So ever after this, we call this the imperial period, where uh, Julius Caesar's adopted son, after another civil war, a non-peaceful transition of power, always in the, Repu the old Republican period, we see peaceful transitions of power. But in the the new Republican period, if we can even call it that, we see these rise of the war of warlord great generals who put their own individual interests ahead of that of the state, and Octavian Caesar finally takes control, and he is he's able to bring in a period of peace after a long time of civil wars. Um, but again, it's the it's the rule through the one man, and he tries to make it look very Republican. But Rome can never really go back to the way it was, um, and Rome will remain an an empire rather than a republic until uh, its fall in 476. Um, Rome itself was a massive, massive empire. Um, it was one that controlled uh, the vast majority of the world's trade, and you see shipments of grain coming in from as far as Egypt. Um, you see uh, you see exchange of goods, of wine, of, of silks, of, of fine luxury items that go all across the Mediterranean world in a very globalized way. Um, and when you see, uh, you see all this happening in, within uh, the early imperial period of Augustus, you see conquests of, uh, of later emperors that go into the north of Europe um, and uh, where ideas are exchanged, people... Um, take slaves and uh, they take wives and they take uh, they take goods everywhere. So you see a massive exchange of ideas, uh, and but you begin to see Rome starting to crack under its own weight um, as as peaceful transitions of power cease after a time of of fairly good emperors. Um, and you see that eventually because of the ideas, uh, the military ideas as, as provincial peoples uh, and, and people who were thought of as barbarians uh, learn from the technologies as well as the ideas and, and, uh, and knowledge of, of, uh, of military tactics, um, they themselves rise up against Rome in vastly larger coalitions. Um, and eventually the, the famous historian Cassius Dio from the time, uh, he says, our empire turned from an age of gold to one of iron and rust. 
So we see external problems, we see internal problems, we don't see uh, peaceful transitions of power, the centralized government fails, and uh, the outside, and we see uh, uh, coalitions of barbarians coming in from the outside, we see the devaluation of coinage, we see uh, extreme overspending by the central government. Gee, does all of this sound very similar to you? Um, what once was a great and powerful economy, you can see the the magnitude of the value of Roman coinage here, and you can see it plummeting, and you can see attempts to reform it, and you can see um, ways that the Roman world tried to rebuild its economy. The point is there was a huge economy uh, within Rome. There was a globalized system that was connected, and it began to crumble and fall apart um, as the centralized management began to fall apart. Um, again, we talked about these uh, these Turkmen's peoples that began to migrate in from as far as Mongolia, who are, of course, eventually the Huns, Attila the Hun, the scourge of God, as he's often called. Um, they come from the steppes of Asia and push into the Roman Empire. This was a highly interconnected world. Why did they come? Well, they wanted to pillage. They wanted to, the wealth and luxury, and eventually they will come to settle in these regions. Why? Because they had heard of it. They knew of this region that was famous for its riches, uh, and it was ripe to plunder. So we see uh, uh, Asian nomads moving across 6,000 miles of grassland, coming to take over the Roman Empire, or try to take over the Roman Empire. Sounds like a highly connected, globalized world to me. Um, so at the end of the, or at, uh, right at uh, really the, the beginning of the imperial period, we, we see another force that will, will take over in the stead of, of the Roman imperial government, and that is Christianity. There is this religion dedicated to uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the great uh, philosopher and uh, the the deity himself. Um, and it's all quite complex. We won't get into the theology of it, but uh, the this one this revolution of ideas that is exchanged all over the Mediterranean world and much much farther, all the way to India and East uh, and uh, would be taken all the way into China. Um, but this religion. Where the that was the ideas that would transform from tribal, traditional, local religion to one of a centralized and controlled religion from Rome um, came about over the course of the first three hundred years of uh, of the first millennia, and it's really quite impressive to see how successful uh, the uh, Christianization of the world was. And how quickly ideas can can spread in a, in a time where they didn't have internet or anything like that. So it, it suggests that uh, these are people that are coming together to share in local connectivity, or they were there they are connected at a local, at a regional, and an international level. And the church itself became highly uh, organized. Uh, that the pope really began to take on the leader of the Christian church uh, f uh, from Rome. Um, began to take on this kind of almost imperial role, and uh, these the dioceses were controlled. Each diocese, which is a, a territorial unit that the church uh, gave to a bishop, and this bishop played the role kind of of a Roman governor, uh, and the bishop would appoint priests who would go out into the world, and they would uh, they would of course spread uh, Christianity, but they would also govern. They would, because these are the only people that can read and write, um, and it's very important. So there is this, of course, exchange of ideas, but there's also this assertion of a new kind of culture and a new kind of of, of uh, ruling class uh, that will come to dominate throughout the Middle Ages. But again, it all suggests highly interconnected worlds. Uh, and here you can see kind of the development of the church hierarchy, and it's very sophisticated. You have, of course, the Bishop of Rome, as I said, and then you have other archbishops that are over bishops and bishops who are over priests and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, again, highly interconnected world. So we're going to uh, stop right here at uh, um, sort of the, the beginning of the church, and we're going to now enter the Middle Ages because after 476... 
um, the world really becomes a different world. And the old classical world has been transformed into something entirely different from a highly sophisticated urbanized world to one of a very rural um, and not so highly interconnected world during the early Middle Ages, at least in Europe. Now, outside of Europe, um, the, uh, the present-day Middle East um, and uh, uh, Persia, China, the Silk Road, Northern Africa, these regions remain highly sophisticated, highly urbanized. Um, the trade continues there, but just simply for Europe, this really becomes what is called the Dark Ages. So thanks for uh, listening to this lecture, and we will uh, pick back up here with the Middle Ages next time. So thanks a lot. Stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.